Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I feel a bit of a imposter really because for the past 11 years I've just been involved in an experiment of what seemed to me to be a demonstration of an, of an alternative way of living. Nothing other than that. Don't have any great qualifications in this area. I've had a heck of a track record doing a heck of a number of things from, as you say, Rona a local government to chairing a hospital trust to advising government and doing forest... And there's never been anything in my life that is more important than what I do now all the time, which is bang on about Incredible Edible and how each and every one of us is part of a solution for building a better tomorrow. Not a problem. So all I'm going to do now is tell you a story, because that's all I do. So for those that have heard this story before, now is the time to have a quick ziz. You're, you won't be able to ziz for too long, because as I say, I'm extremely noisy. But it's just a simple story of what a bunch of people can actually do when they set their minds to it, and people in this room know that that's the case. Um, it's just a load of holiday shots. You're not going, it's not going to be death by PowerPoint, I hope. But hopefully along the way, you'll feel some of the joys that we have felt, and hopefully at the end, when we start to talk to each other, you can steer me in some directions about some great ideas, because this is all about us doing our thing, not being perfect, sharing with each other, with a common vision of a kinder prosperity. The title page is significant for me, because what I want to do is to work with people who want to create a new normal. Not folks who have got a great case study, or something that's deemed to be best practice, or something that's got a lot of beans counted against it that don't actually mean a heck of a lot. No, I'm not interested in that. That's grand. But what I want is for our kids to wake up in the morning to a new tomorrow. To wake up in the morning to a world that is kinder to each other, to a world that can live within its planetary boundaries, to a world where we know and we care about our neighbours and we take personal responsibility for our actions. And that that is a joyful thing. That when our kids wake up in the morning and they've got a local job and they're eating local food and they know where it comes from and they understand biodiversity, whatever, that that is the legacy that we're passing on to the next generation. Not something that is abnormal to the system, but something that is absolutely mainstream. So here's the story of Incredible Edible. Let me tell you the beginning. So 11 years ago, in a town like that, I think some of you have been to Tobinden. It's a town of 15,000 people. Rains a fair bit. Bit windy. A few sheep that fall over in a gale. Not a place that you'd necessarily think you were going to start a food revolution from. It just happens to be the place that I live. And it just happens to be the place that I can get my hands on and do something about, as each and well, every one of us can, in the place that we call home. It's a place where my daughter was brought up. It's a place that's got issues around health, childhood obesity, unemployment, a sense of purpose, a sense of place what it was about, you know, it was, it was a place where textiles were made that was significant in the Industrial Revolution but kind of just became a little bit of a kind of commuter belt town for Manchester and Leeds. Well that was kind of 11 years ago and now it's moved from looking like that to having brilliant sunshine every single day, obviously, and growing fruit and vegetables and herbs all over the middle of town, as indeed I'm sure you've got all over Cumbria, in very, very public places. We call them propaganda gardens. The reason they're called propaganda gardens is because they're there to start a conversation about something that wasn't there before. About something that's just popped up overnight. About something that might remind us about what our grandmas used to do, or our granddads used to grow, or our mums used to bake or stuff that we've not seen for donkey's years, or stuff that we've never seen, but the person that we're next to reminds us of what that is, because maybe they've come from a different part of the world and maybe they understand the importance of that particular herb or that particular vegetable or that particular fruit to them in their culture. Food, it's a great conversation piece. And they're not called guerrilla gardening, because in the early days, when I went to my mate Mary, who also lives in Tombardon, and said, go on, we're going to do this, Mary, and I'll tell you a little bit about that story. She said, well, we're not calling it guerrilla gardening, it's far too full of testosterone, so we're not having that. So, in, in a kind of more gentle way, 
we decided to call them propaganda gardens because ultimately that's all they are. They start a conversation. Now then, why 11 years ago did I kind of think we should have a crack at doing something? Well, I'm old enough, and as I've said out there, I really quite like being old. It's just great. You can get away with all sorts of naughtiness that when you're younger you can't get away with. But 11 years ago, I was reminded at a conference in London, which was a Landscape Institute conference, and Tim Lang, if anybody knows Tim, he was Professor of Food Policy at uh, City University in London, and he's a great guy, and I love him to bits, but oh my lord, he can be really depressing when he's on form. Uh, about the state of the world, about using the planetary resources by the time we get to September, all the stuff that we already know about. And, and it reminded me as I sat in the audience and listened to him, I've lived through Rio and the Earth Summit when we all got really excited that the leaders of the world were coming together and they were going to do something really positive because they suddenly got it that they weren't living within planetary means and, they, you know, and we weren't going to pass on a great um, opportunity for our kids to live well and prosper as we had done. And Rio came and Rio went. And there were some good things at grassroots level, local agenda 21 and stuff, but nationally, internationally, hmm, not a right lot. Kyoto came and went. Copenhagen came and went. They all came and went because words are cheap. And yet every single year that the people that we elected to do something didn't do anything, things got worse. Weather swings water problems, increasingly divided societies, all the issues that we know now 11 years on from the IPCC reports and the UN data and heaven knows what else, it's not really great for us to pass on to our kids. And I can't see any real leadership coming through the ranks yet. We're starting to see the snifters of that, but not yet. So, so I'm sat in the audience and I'm thinking, this is rubbish, I'm, this is absolutely awful. So either I'm going to be truly depressed and just drink a heck of a lot more gin all the time and just like forget about everything, or just maybe, why don't I roll up my sleeves and why don't I see what me, Pam Warhurst, and the people she knows, what we can do in the place we call home to try and bring about a kinder prosperity, to try and reconnect and give us hope of a future where, as I've said, we're not a, we're not a victim and we do not need a cheque to drop through our letterbox and we most certainly do not need permission to build something better for our children. So how are we going to do that? So I got on a train and I started to think and it was a virgin train um, and it took two hours to get from Manchester to Todmorden and in that two hours I just made up something and that something was called Incredible Edible. I didn't consult, didn't write a report, didn't take a strategy to anybody, just made it up. Because why the heck not, this is me and my life and what I can actually do and that's I think the message about Incredible Edible, this is eat us and our lives and what we can actually do without waiting for somebody else to catch up and do it and give us permission in the first place. So. The first thought that I had was, how are, we, how are we going to motivate people? Because I know people care about their kids. I know people want a better tomorrow for their next generation. I know that they really want to do something about some of these big issues that are coming over the horizon. But sometimes it's really difficult when you're holding down three jobs and you're trying to look after a family to work out where you start. So how are we actually going to find the route map to something that means we can build something better for tomorrow? Well, it's obvious. It's food. Because food is the Trojan horse to living our lives differently. Food is the universal language that unites us across age, across income, across culture and across ability. Food is the leveller. We all do something about food. We don't need a master's degree to be able to do something about food. We can grow it. We can cook it. We can buy it. We can choose where we buy it from. We can like it, we can not like it, we can have a chat about it, we can share it, we can do stuff on our street, we can have big lunches, whatever. Food is the leveller. I could have done anything. Could have done transport, could have done energy, could have done a number of things. And you do many, many in this part of the world. But 11 years ago, when I needed a door to go through and I needed a language to speak to the vast majority of people in the place that I called home, it seemed to me it was food. Second thing was, okay, if it's going to be food, can 
know, what's the storyline? How are we actually going to tell our story and get people interested in what we're doing? So, I invented something called the three spinning plates. Now, this is really simple. I'm still on this virgin train, right? And oh, the only bit of paper I've got is a virgin serviette. And a virgin serviette is really small. So this isn't going to be a complicated model, is it? It's just wonderful when life presents itself in such a simple way. So how could we actually use food to change the nature of our communities? To change how we feel about ourselves? To change how we feel about what we demand of the people we elect? Or the people in positions of responsibility around board tables, way down the line? What might that model actually look like? And it seemed to me we needed a really simple model that everybody could find a little bit of something to do on. Not the whole lot, you don't have to do the whole lot. All with food at its heart. So here's the three propositions around the three spinning plates, which for those of you who have been around a few blocks resemble the three circles of sustainability. But we don't have to know about sustainability, we just have to give a damn about tomorrow. So the first plate is, well, why don't we just grow food everywhere in the middle of our town? Why don't we just forget about asking people's permission to actually do it? Why don't we just do it? We've got seeds in the bottom drawer in packets that we're never going to use. We've got stuff in our back garden and our front garden. We can split and plant. We've even got little somewhere or other that we can go and buy some cherry trees from, dead cheap, and stick them in the middle of town. There's all sorts of ways that we, the ordinary people, can start to grow food in very public places. Because there is no point in having a propaganda garden down a back alley that nobody passes. You want it on your high street, you want it at your doctors, you want it at the police station, you want it in the middle of your park, you want it wherever you can. And the very first propaganda garden that we did was a dog toilet, actually. In the middle of Todmorden, on Burnley Road, if anybody knows that part of the world, there is a grass verge. A grass verge that is public realm. I'm going to come back to that word public realm. Public's an interesting word, isn't it? I think it's got something to do with us, but anyway. So there's this, this is dog toilet, which is a grass verge, which the council hasn't got any money. And I love councils, this is not me knocking a council, I used to, you know, I was the leader of one. So I'm completely on message with public service. But this verge on the side of the road, nobody got any money to look after it. So what happens? It grows long grass. The dogs wander in there and do whatever they do. People throw litter cans down there and fag packets and it ends up looking a right mess. So we thought, right, we'll clear that up and turn that into a herb garden. So after a public meeting in a cafe to say, hey guys, should we do something in Tottenham that's great for our kids? Should we use food to create new jobs? Should we, ta we started to talk about this. And they said, yeah, okay. Well, a few of us are interested in doing that. So we turned up one weekend and we put our rubber gloves on and we cleaned up all the mess and we cut down all the stuff that wasn't um, valuable and we planted in there rosemary and bay and cherry trees and balm and whatever we could bit of chardia whatever we'd got around there now of course we didn't ask the local authority could we have permission to clean up a dog toilet why would you do that I speak as, as I say, an ex-leader of a local authority. When you are giving your gifts for your community, I think it's a complete not a waste of time. And quite frankly, it's quite unkind to go to a representative of the local authority, be it officer or member, and ask whether you can clean up a dog toilet and turn it into a community herb garden. Why? Because they're going to have to go back to the office, they're going to have to write a report, they're going to have to take it to a committee, they're going to have to have a conversation about it, and by the time you've done that, it's gone off you. Yeah. So why bother? Just do it. Nobody's ever died, nobody's ever sued us. It's always added to the fantastic feel of a place when you start to create an edible town. So that was the first thing we did. Community spaces all over the place. I've got a few slides to show you what that's about. But let's imagine our children walking through the edible landscape in 10 years' time that we created. Reconnecting people with seasonality reconnecting people with biodiversity, reconnecting people with maybe the thought that there'd be a job in food somewhere, local food, maybe they want to be the urban farmers of tomorrow, I don't know. The environment you're brought up in affects how you think. So if we make it edible, it's, it's worth a punt, isn't it, that it might have a positive impact on people. The second plate is learning. Why? Because folks have forgotten how to do all that stuff. You know, there's whole generations of people who don't know how to peel a spud. They've never been taught it. 
There's whole generations of people who haven't the foggiest idea what to do with something if they can't tear off the top and stick it in a microwave. There's whole generations of people who don't know how to grow what where. Of course. So, let's find the folks out there in our communities, in Todmorden at that time, who actually know how to pickle and bottle or graft a tree, who know how to make great meals, who know when to plant what where, who know something, maybe, about permaculture, but it's not required. We just want you to start thinking about food and doing what you want to do, whatever that might be. And there's a whole host of people in our communities that are very often not spoken to, who may feel lonely, who may feel isolated, and they have all the knowledge you would ever need in your life to share with you around food. Because again, we only do food, single point of focus, maximum elaboration. So that's the second plate, learning. It's got nothing to do with professional qualifications. It's got nothing to do with what schools are doing inside the... I love schools. I'm doing stuff with schools, but they're a hard gig, particularly secondary schools. So rather than be frustrated, this is a positive movement. Let's do the stuff from the school gate to the kitchen table, and let's hope in time that it complements what's going on within the schoolyard, which is fantastic if you've got the money and if you've got the right teachers and assistants in place. Fabulous. Third plate, you've spun one, you've created edible landscapes, you've spun two, You've shown people what to do with that and why they'd bother doing it in the first place because they know how to cook it. Third plate is simple. Is it not possible that if you are connecting with local food every day, in and out, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, you might just want to use the pound in your pocket, if you're fortunate enough to have a pound in your pocket, in support of a local producer or a local farmer or your local market? Is it not possible that you will start to think that instead of just nipping to the supermarket and getting something in a plastic bag thrown from halfway over the globe, you might want to go and have a chat in your local market about tasting something. Now, this may seem obvious to you guys. This way of living may be obvious, but this is not a movement for people who are already on board. This is a movement for people who really give a damn but don't know where to start. This is a movement for ordinary people who want to build a better tomorrow and see that business plate spinning because maybe their kids will be the next food entrepreneur or maybe the next person to set up a street market or may, whatever it might be. And together, the edible landscapes and the learning and the business opportunities presented by that because you have stimulated demand and supply will follow. I'm an economist. Why people in their life set up social enterprises all the time without stimulating demand in the first place is beyond my comprehension. If you stimulate the demand, the business will follow. That's all there is to it. But you've got to do it for long enough. And given we live in a world with one, two, three year lifespans, it's about time we did something about that. You don't turn around the behaviour patterns of generations in three years. It takes you a long time. But luckily, when we're all doing it together, we maybe can do it faster. Okay, so that's the, that's the three plates. That's why we did what we did. And this is what happened. And the whole thing is an experiment, right? It's really important to remember that it's an experiment. We've got no master plan. I've got no statisticians sat in a cupboard. This is all a bunch of volunteers doing it. We just knew we didn't like the world that we got, but we didn't know exactly that we were going to set a fire under quite as much as we actually did. So year one, creating propaganda gardens. Now, because I've said you don't do it in very obvious places, it becomes quite fun to work out where you do do it. So we did it in front of the health centre and around the health centre. We did it at the police station. We did it at the railway station. We did it in front of the college. We've done it wherever there is a bit of land where we can do something creative by creating propaganda gardens that grow food that is always to be shared by the wider community. I've chosen these two as two specific examples of when you start doing that, the weirdest things happen. Sometimes we ask permission, particularly if you're dealing with the police. It's probably a very good idea. So when we came to the doctors and when we started to grow in front of the police station, we said to the doctors and to the police, would you mind if we took up the things that you've planted, um, which are inedible, around the health centre, and we started to plant things that are edible? And they said, no, we don't mind as long as we don't have to do it and we don't have to give you any money for it. Not a problem. That's fine. Same with the police. Excuse me, sir. You've got a great 
uh, with the concrete in front of your police station. Do you mind if we put some raised beds there and grow some things? No, that's, that's, yeah, okay. They thought we were bombing, obviously. Um, no, that's fine, absolutely fine, um, as long as we don't have to do it and we don't have to pay it. That's right. So, those two examples were complemented by the other propaganda guys that I've talked about. But I think it's important to point out that even in those early days, 11 years ago, we seemed to be scratching at something that was really quite interesting. So, in Tobinden, they build this health centre. It's a brand new health centre, eight, nine, ten years ago or whatever, um, and it's surrounded by inedible prickly plants. Meanwhile, the NHS nationally spends millions of quid on an Eat Five a Day campaign in order to reconnect people with food and health. Well, let me see. Is it not sensible if you stop doing inedible prickly plant and started creating things around health centres that you can eat? Yes, it is. More of that, because we're starting to have an impact at a national level. So that's all we did. We turned up and we got the stuff and we planted apple trees and pear trees and, we, and raspberry canes and, and we did lots of apothecary herbs at the back and we just planted loads and loads of stuff and we tried to do it in partnership with the In Bloom group so they did some lovely lavender and white roses because we'd really cheesed them off at one point by pulling up some of their rose bushes and planting cabbages and that did not go down terribly well. So we, we spent a little bit of time trying to apologise on that one and I think we found an accommodation. But actually, no, we have a health centre that has health in the middle of it. Isn't that the sensible thing to do? And the police station, interestingly enough, with this land in front, we just had to do it. So Nick, one of the people who was uh, creating propaganda gardens with us right at the beginning, and again a volunteer, three raised beds, we started to plant sweet corn. Not that sweet corn is native to the South Pennine, because it's not. But it grows taller than the police and it makes us laugh. So we planted it, because you've got to have humour along the way with all this. You know, if you've got to try and change the world and bring a revolution, then smile. So we planted that, and together with that we did all manner of things. You know, the things that grow fast and the things that don't grow so fast and the berries that kids can eat and whatever else it might be. Now the police, when we asked them, could we do this? said, yes, as I've already mentioned, but they really did think we were barking mad. They really did think we've got two, you know, kind of like getting on old ladies, we'd better say yes to them else, they might create a fuss. Interestingly enough, years three, four and five, they start getting visited by other police stations all over the place. Years six, seven and eight, they come up with the idea that it's really odd because when people plant food in the middle of Todmorden, which is not a dead posh like middle class place, it's a typical working class town, People don't vandalise food, so vandalism is done. They'll still take the tops off daffodils, but they will not start to vandalise parsnips or whatever in the middle of the town. And the other interesting thing was, the police's own narrative says community relations has never been better. People just laugh and they smile and they, because it diffuses tension. Are you, are you watching today, Constable? Or shall I water? Whatever it might be, it kind of just is a really nice entree to people in a town, irrespective of whether they've got a hat on or they've not got a hat on, just getting on together. And we never anticipated that that was going to be the reaction, but it has and is increasingly so. And then the learning plate. That bottom one is where, with all the stuff growing around the health centre, we took over a community kitchen in the health centre and we had one of our sessions. You'll have done it here loads of times, where the doctors and the nurses and the community and the patients start to celebrate what has grown around. Again, wouldn't that be good if that was normal? And then these young people digging up the police station beds, learning about soil animals, learning about you know, what it takes to actually start growing, complementing what's happened in the schoolyard, outside the schoolyard. And I want to stress again, it ha we wanted to do stuff with schools, but then it became so obvious that with the tensions within schools, probably the best bet for a load of volunteers was to make sure the great stuff happening inside the schoolyard didn't result in a pot noodle on the table at home. Just maybe you didn't go through this kind of narnia when you came out of the school uh, gate into a world that didn't actually have the respect for the stuff that you'd been doing inside the schoolyard. It's not rocket science, this is just about human behaviour. But we had a little piece of a jigsaw, and that's all we've got. A piece of a jigsaw that makes a picture of a kind of tomorrow. And the third one was edible landscapes all over the shop, doing that learning, sharing it, growing, cooking, whatever it might be. The impact on business was really interesting. Now, groups that set up Incredible Edible seem to have a bit of a problem with working out what to do with the business plate when it's the easiest thing in the entire world because 
11 years ago, we kind of thought there has to be a job in this for our next generation. This is, this is not about waking up one morning and suddenly realising that you know, you've got all this altruism running through your veins. It's actually about creating a new normal where you live within sustainable limits. So what could we do, a load of volunteers, to create a greater interest that would stimulate a local sticky money economy in our town? Well, it was obvious. We've got a market hall that was not. It wasn't on its knees, but it wasn't performing extremely well. So we have to start with that, because that for us was a proxy for a sticky money economy. What could we do? We got six blackboards and put incredible edible tobinant at the top of them. That cost us 30 quid. We just put a five or each, that's fine. And we gave them to any market stall in that hall that was selling something local. Whether it was a, the beef guy, or whether it was a cheese woman, or whether it was the bread one, or whoever it was, if it was something local, we gave them a blackboard and said, just, just scribble a story on. Just tell people what you're doing. And of course, people love local food, don't they? So, you know, you start to say, and you start to tell people that this is happening in the market hall. And over time, year one, year two, year three, year four, this isn't a quick fix. People started going in the market hall. They wanted to taste, they wanted to understand how that woman made the brawn, or they wanted to chase that local cheese, or they had to go on some local beer or bread or whatever it might be. And over time, the footfall increased. And over time, it is true to say we've got more um, pop-up stalls, we've got more food in local cafes, we've got more food and supplies in local pubs or whatever it is. And suddenly this place, called Tottenham, that everybody drove through to Trendy Hebden Bridge was the place that you actually stopped at because people gave a damn because they were investing in local food because you could put your own money into something that meant something to you and that's all we did that's all this experiment was all about creating edible landscapes sharing what we're doing and supporting sticky money economies and that was Todd 11 years ago and then a year after that Wakefield and then a year after that Wigan, and then a year after that Dunstable, and then a year after that Bath. And suddenly, we'd moved from a town of 16,000 people to having a network of networks in Lambeth, which is 450,000 people. Then we've got little Ilfracoon in North Devon, with whatever their population is, it's not very big, doing amazing things, spinning their three plates in their own way. This isn't regimented, we don't send the thought police down to make sure they're all doing the same thing. It's just have a crack, using food, spin three plates, see if you can change the world. Easy really. People came to us after the earthquake in Christchurch in New Zealand, which is seven years ago now I think. Why? Not because we're the world's best cabbage growers. Not because we'd got the solution to life, the universe and everything, no. Because they were visiting sites that could bring hope. That was all. They'd got a major city in New Zealand that 80% of it went down. That not only meant people lost everything they'd got, it meant the city was bankrupt. So when you've got out and you've no access to funds, but you care, what do you do? You invest in hope. And when I went back to speak five years after the um, earthquake and travelled around these what were now vacant lots that had been major buildings in the town. What was happening there? Two things. Community artwork and food growing all over the place. Totally fantastic. And in France so it's absolutely bonkers and they've gone completely mad and they're doing it a slightly different way. And in Japan they picked up all the growing that we actually did on the canal bank. Again, we just did it. We didn't ask permission. It was pretty unloved. Dogs took advantage of it, so why would we ever ask British Waterways at the time, now Canals and Rivers Trust, to do it? Just do it. Again, we've never been stopped. We've always been complimented. People want that type of initiative. They want the communities to start to take back ideas. And exactly the same in Japan. So they're growing food all along, as far as I know. I've not been to Japan. But I'm assuming that when they came to visit us and they said they were doing that, no, that's exactly what they're going to do. So all over the place, communities of different sizes are waking up to the fact that this isn't just about growing food. This is about growing self-belief. This is about growing an understanding that we are part of that solution. This is about getting the confidence to start to have conversations with other people and just making it up as you go along. Because we couldn't get it much more wrong than we've actually got it at the moment, so why not have a crack at doing something positive? What was really interesting, however, is when we started all those years ago around Mary's table in Todman, and I never envisaged that this was going to create a movement. I always wanted 
to learn lessons and deliver them to the boardroom. But I didn't know how to do that. I'd got no idea how to do that. And yet, over the years, having conversations like that, seeing the light go on in people's eyes, getting people buzzing and learning and sharing from each other about how we can all do things differently, suddenly we've got a movement. Not only have we got a movement, but God bless them, the lottery actually came to us, because I'm not a greatest fan of chasing money, although we all need money, and said, can we help? <laughs> you certainly can. So we created a number of investments in some of our major groups who can be the mother hen for other groups in the area. That's one thing that they allowed us to do. We've created a website with oodles of ideas about how you can do whatever you want to do in an incredible edible because another group somewhere else has already invented it. Just go in there, save yourself some brain space, just copy it and just start to spread the word. Tell the stories, all about storytelling, create the blogs, get the pictures up there. The lottery allowed us to do that. That was fantastic. Never would we have started this conversation by asking them. Just as never did we start this conversation by asking the local authorities, would, did we have permission? Never. But over the years, we've all built confidence in each other in what has become a movement. And not once have we killed anybody, and not once have we been sued by any local authority, and not once has any health trust done anything but say to us, this is fantastic, I wish everybody was doing this. It's really interesting that when we use our gifts to spread the word, people really respect that and want to come and do something about it. So we seem to be growing a movement. Spread, not scale. I don't know, <laughs> Rona, you'll remember this. Everybody says, yeah, but how are you going to scale it up? You don't scale up human kindness. You spread it. You can scale up widget making as much as you like, but when it comes to human activity, you just spread it. So the top is Wakefield, where they've got a particular interest in helping more and more people do mini plots. That's, that's their particular interest. Mini plots and orchards, that's fine. The middle one is an estate in Salford, in Greater Manchester. Cross-community activity around food. The bottom left is me planting up the corner of a northern rail, dare I say that, um, park, car park in Tobedon. Interestingly enough, now, working with northern rail, who are probably going to go belly up any moment now, just when you thought you'd got something, but never mind. Northern said, we want every platform to be edible. We want you to talk to us about what our estate can do to grow food on. This is great, because this is creating a new normal, so you can get off a train and pick your rosemary or pick your kale or whatever it is and go home. Never enough to sweep the lot up. Nobody ever sweeps the lot up. You know, and if they do, and if they are slightly inebriated so-and-so starts to break the odd thing, well, they've not just destroyed the Taj Mahal, have they? You just replant it. And if everybody takes your onions, it's because you've not planted enough onions, so plant some more onions. <laughs> the bottom one is a wonderful community fire station in Manchester, because this isn't about half a dozen of us doing this. This is about spreading the word so everybody does. So the chief con um, fireman in Manchester said, could we nick your idea and could we do it in some of our community uh, fire stations across the piece? And we said, oh, we'd love you to do it. And that's exactly what we did, because fire people have got downtime when people aren't setting fire to things, and communities have got some people who are rather challenged one way or another, occasionally, setting fire to things. So the firemen thought it was a really good idea to say, anybody want to come out here, come and help us make this, come and help us um, wheelbarrow this soil in, come and help us grow, take it home to your mother, whatever, created great community conversations, created opportunities of the ladder of opportunity for some people to get out of one place into somewhere that was a lot better. Fire people have already told you about that other one up there. It's a small allotment. It's not an allotment, it's a public realm outside some local shops in Dunstable, looked after by the estate itself, sold into some of those shops, helping some people with mental illness. There's nothing clever about any of this. Everybody's been doing bits and bobs, but not necessarily joining up the dots all the time. Because as we start to plant food, we start to change the spaces of our lives. We start to think about planning. We start to think about why are we not creating edible garden cities of tomorrow. We start to think about what is this thing called public realm? Why would anybody tell us that we can't do what we want? 
if it's for the benefit of the community on public realm, given it's got that telltale word public in front of it, wouldn't you actually think that was something that we creatively could use our gifts to help people share and rethink what that looks like? Middle of Bristol, growing food. Some of the most challenged areas on the outskirts of Bristol growing food, making them welcoming, helping people enjoy their sandwiches there, helping people set up small businesses around. Isle of Butte in Scotland, redefining their front, reconnecting their communities that are kind of like not the fishing communities that used to be, are looking for a new identity for themselves that is as low carbon as they can possibly get. Bunch of older people in a, an elderly person's home in Salford, wonderful group of Asian ladies, growing some fantastic food on the outskirts of Rochdale, Overston, people changing the spaces of their lives without permission, but for the better of everybody that lives there. Opening minds, that's all this is about. Let's just not be constrained about what we can't do and how terrible we are. Let's bring hope and joy and let's say to young people, yeah, these are the soil animals that make all the difference in life and death on this planet. Young people moving into forest schools, other people having a cup of tea after a day doing some planting, other people reconnecting with people that have got some issues in society, but huge skills and stories to tell, just opening people's minds. And all we're doing as a bunch of volunteers is using the Trojan horse of food to help people see they don't have to accept the rules of yesterday if what they're doing is using their personal gifts to create better rules for tomorrow. Doing business. You know, who would have thought a bunch of volunteers could actually do something to stimulate a sticky money economy without a business advisor dropping in and telling them how to do it? Well, it appears that we can do it for ourselves. These are some of the local markets. This is Ratcliffe Market on the outskirts of Berry that has got a wonderful man who's in danger of getting trench foot, as far as I can see, growing micro salads in some of the rather swishy areas underneath the market. But the market itself is growing local food and creating great food in the market, whether it's pizza or whether it's uh, curry or whatever it might be. On our own market, we have increasing people who have moved to Todmorden because they really want to do something positive through food for themselves and their family. You know, they're creating small holdings, they're setting up their own markets, they're, they're making their own pies and their pickles or whatever it might be, all over the place, doing business as ordinary people because in the future, so many more of us need to think about our own entrepreneurship in order to live in a sticky money economy where we can all benefit. I don't take any notice of that. It's just like there's been shed loads of groups set up and there's been God knows how many hours done and we all know that that This is not a bean counting. I'm not that interested. Lottery likes things like that, but it kind of goes against my grain. But the bottom line is this. That was only ever half the picture. The whole point is we needed to demonstrate to the people at the boardrooms, to the elected members, all of whom I've worked with over the years, all of whom mean really, really well and often do some great things, but we needed to demonstrate that if they could get out of the way in the issues that affected the quality of our lives, where it was appropriate, we could step up to the plate and we could do things for ourselves. We had to show them that we could create responsibly the types of stimulation that created a vibrant market hall, the types of volunteer work that kept edible landscapes looking fabulous, the types of sharing of knowledge that allowed more and more people from more and more cultures to actually start to understand how to live well and prosper in the world. That was only ever half the plan. Because if you don't take that knowledge and that power from the grassroots, and deliver it to the people who can change the frameworks of our lives, you're always going to be pushing water uphill. And that's a hard thing to do. So I'm not keen on pushing water uphill. So what did we do? How could we make it easier for everybody to live incredibly? Not just us in this room, but every single person on every single estate across the UK. I only know about the UK. I know things go on in other policy areas of the world, but let's just think about the UK. How could we mean that every single person, irrespective of whatever their ability, could live incredibly? We've learned a lot. We need to be bold enough to deliver those messages where they can have some impact. We know that with more land, 
we can feed ourselves better. With more people living well because they're physically active, they're, they're eating nutritious food, they're feeling a part of a community and they have a belief in themselves. And those four things are all the elements of living well and prospering. And you look at this, the blue zone right through to the world health, that's all it takes to help us all live well and prosper. And more skills and jobs. Because if we're not going to do it, who's investing in the urban farmers of tomorrow? Who's investing in the hydroponics and aquaponics? And who's investing in the architects that can build the cities of tomorrow where we can grow our own food and live well through the power of small actions? Not a right lot of people. Let's celebrate them where they are. But they are few and far between. So all that we've been doing for 11 years is learning our craft at a grassroots level and telling our stories warts and all in order that we can find those anchor institutions those hospitals those local authorities those prisons whatever it might be where the light is on in the eye of the people that are running them who are prepared to listen to a piece of a story that is a piece of a future that's all it is it's not the master plan it's a piece of a story for the future in order that we can change the rules in order that we can create a kind of prosperity. That's the end game. That's the end game. We need to change some rules around here because they're not helpful for each and every one of our young people to live well and prosper in the future. And the really great thing about 11 years of doing this is folks are folks, whether they're around the kitchen table or the boardroom table. Folks are folks. Everybody wants a better tomorrow, whether you're the director of a company or the leader of a local authority or a mum who's just dropped the kids or probably all three because we all live portfolio lives. Folks are folks and my experience is that people are ready now, more than they were 11 years ago, to listen to an alternative proposition based on a lot of graft and a lot of storytelling. What might those propositions start to look like? It's an experiment. I'm not precious if you guys want to define things in a different way, but this is just the start of a 10. If we were looking at the more land bit of that proposition a few slides back, I would say public realm needs to change. We need to stop worrying about what we can't mow and start thinking about what we can do with it that is better for the well-being of our citizens. We need to rethink ownership of land. You know, we've got a lot of interest in commons. That's, that's great. And we've got a lot of interest in community land trusts and in community housing. There's a lot of interest in doing things differently. So let's start thinking about greater community ownership where it's required. This isn't a boot camp. You don't have to do this. Of that public realm, whatever it might be. We're rethinking our parks. Our parks should still be areas of joy for our children to play in. And they should still be beautiful with their trees and their orchards, but they could also be something else, maybe. And we all know in the place we call home what would work and what doesn't, which is why this is just a movement of people who give a damn about the place they call home and the people that are growing up there. And let's create more edible towns and cities. We're working as it happens, we just put it out there, with a wonderful organisation called the Town and Country Planning Association. Wonderful. They were the people that gave birth to the Garden City movement all those years ago, Ebenezer Howard. That all went by the board, didn't it? Sadly. But there was a time, a long time ago, when it was deemed appropriate to build decent homes for people with decent gardens where they could grow their own food and the kids play. It was deemed the right thing to do. Let's not forget it. I would just say, let's make them edible. Let's make sure that when we create the towns and the villages and the cities of tomorrow, we always make sure they are edible. How do we make healthy people live longer with our own little piece of the jigsaw? Not a great master plan? Well, we are challenging the NHS at a national level in a really nice and pleasant way to seek those trusts and doctors' organisations who want to do three things. Because there's no point in saying go and hug a tree and that's it. That won't work. Go and do three things, please. One, always make your mainstream estate policy edible. Right? Never, ever, ever again plant something you can't eat. 
stupid. Secondly, please, when you are designing hospitals or when you are investing in doctor surgeries, make sure there's a community kitchen that's within a stone's throw, either in it or close to it. Because if we want to put health back into the NHS and we're thinking food, why wouldn't we have people cooking the stuff that's growing around the health centre or the doctor's surgery, sharing it with their street, learning new skills with their neighbours, or imagining they could set their own small businesses up and create a small income through them? Why not? Why not take the big issues around health, whether that's obesity of children, whether that's loneliness, whether that's mental health, or whatever it might be, and why not start to say that by creating edible landscapes and community kitchens we can actually do something about that? And why does that matter? It matters because 50%, nearly 50% of people who visit doctors do not have communicable diseases. They have lifestyle related illnesses, or they're lonely, or they've got some mental health issues. Fundamentally. 50%. Not my stats. NHS Sustainability Unit starts. Now then, if we're going to get climate change, which we are, and if we're going to get communicable diseases coming back at a rate we've not seen for a heck of a long time, and if we currently have an unsustainable healthcare system, wouldn't it be great if the health worked with us to take that 50% out because we care about people, because we know people, because we want to talk to them about their skills, because we want more people to eat nutritious food? Wouldn't that make sense? Yes, it would. And we're having those conversations with them. And Given they've got whacking great budgets, every single local authority, hospital trust or whatever, has a whacking great procurement budget, which it often spends with breaks or somebody like that. Now, I'm not saying we can suddenly gear up as communities to produce all the food for our kitchens, but we're actually saying to the doctors who want to listen, just choose one product, just one product, buy your eggs local, buy your bread local buy your milk, just one product, bend your procurement budget and put it in the local community. Entirely possible. There are community trusts all over the place starting to do that. It's just not normal yet. Let's try and make it normal. And the third one is skills and jobs. And this matters for all sorts of reasons. I used to chair something called the Aqua Garden, which was a space where young people could learn about aquaponics, hydroponics, and soil based growing. It was set up for the benefit of the young people of Tottenham. It failed because our education system would not recognise it. Because both teachers and pupils and the families of pupils' view was it's only thickest that grow food. This isn't what you want to do. It failed because it was not used to teach all the aspects of life that so many of our young people could do with knowing about. Even if you don't accept the fact that one of the most significant jobs in the future is going to be urban farming, without a shadow of a doubt. You can use food to teach science, technology, engineering, arts and maths. You can use it as normal, and the best teachers are. It's just quite uncommon. We need to invest in those urban farmers, and we need to invest in architects, engineers, designers, planners who understand we need different communities for tomorrow if we're going to have a lot more of our food grown locally, up walls, top of walls, in cellars or wherever else it might be. These things don't just happen, they happen because we designed them. And if we taught young people that that was important, from this high to yay high, that would create a different way of living. And all that lot kind of looks like a new social contract. All that lot says, you know, the way that you used to do to us all the time, it's not going to work anymore because we've got a few things that we know ourselves. What might that social contract look like? We, just on evidence to date, and you could have a completely different one in Ambleside and in Cumbria, but we'll grow and share more of our food, we'll create propaganda gardens, we'll share the lost arts, and we'll support local business, but hey, Powers that be, wherever you are, meet us halfway. This is not one hand clapping. You need to start to rethink your public realm. You need to make all your edible landscapes mainstream. You need to make sure we... And you can read. That's what you need to do. You need to not take this out of your community development budget. You need to mainstream this so we're all doing it 
all the time with every budget that you've possibly got because you are elected to look after us or you have gone into a profession to help our well-being but the system isn't allowing you to do that and we the people want to work with you halfway because together we're going to get a better outcome and all that is about taking the lessons we've learned from the kitchen table into the boardroom where now and I don't know how you feel in this room but 11 years of doing this, I have never known a bunch of people more ready to listen to an alternative proposition. Why? It's called austerity. You wouldn't wish it on anybody, would you? But when there's more money around than you can shake a stick at, why does anybody need to change the system? Hm. Well, we're fine doing things the way we are. When there isn't money to deliver, but people still care, they want to have a conversation with you. They want to start to think about, can they do things? This is not, we'll give you a library with no training. No, this is not that. This is rethink from the grassroots everything you do so it becomes normal in the way we educate, in the way we invest, in the way we spend, in the way we plan, in the way we see space. and in the, It just becomes normal to start to live our lives more kindly. And because we've demonstrated that, we can all see that we can do that within planetary bounds. You know, we've just experienced this. We haven't gone on a course about sustainability. We've just lived our lives differently. And through living it differently, we've had a kinder impact on our environment. And all that is predicated on one simple proposition, which is over the 11 years, the one thing that I hold dearest to my heart is the evidence that this is all about the power of small actions. And it's really important for us to remember that because I have, in my time, sat down, particularly with academics, I have to say, mm, you know, who feel it's far too sophisticated and complicated for ordinary people to be able to come up with some of these challenges. And it's not. Because the one thing that makes the difference is have the will to do it. The rest of it follows. If you haven't got the will, you're never going to get anywhere. But with the will to do it and the understanding that we have it in us, if we all collaborate and cooperate to do it, we can build that kind of tomorrow. And when folks look at me and they kind of want to pat you on the back, there is a thing about this, you know, the community activist, bless her, just go in the corner. I said, just remember, nine miles from where I live, a hundred and odd years ago, when times were tough, a group of people, sat round a table at a moment in time and one said I'll buy a sack of grain and another said I'll buy a sack of something else and we'll split it and we'll see how we go and that was in a place called Rochdale and that created the international cooperative movement ordinary people doing it we have it in us to deliver we have it in us if we believe in ourselves and we believe in the power of small actions and we can evidence that and we have such a little time to get together and do it. But I feel so positive every time I come into a hall like this that together we can build a kind of tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>